It's all well and good to identify the right locations, right? But surely that's not enough. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dash Dot Insider, where we help you to become a better property investor. And on today's show, Gabby and I talk about oh, a few different things, which is quite interesting. Um, what I have noticed over the last, you know, little while is that I have stopped caring about what is happening in a real estate market, or more specifically, real estate market news, which you might find a little interesting given the fact that we run a real estate-based business and surely we should be paying attention to it. But what we talk about in this episode is the power of that we have been able to leverage out of our real estate market predictive models and also our algorithms for market timing, which is super impactful and is actually allowing us to operate in a way that is completely disconnected from the common uh, belief systems that are attached with the Australian real estate media. We also talk about the common mistakes people make by, by looking at rear-facing indicators such as historical price growth, um, all of that kind of stuff. It's a big mistake that people make and I think you can learn a lot from that too. And we also talk about what I learned from a billionaire that I was talking to on the weekend the other day, which was super interesting about how he is making money in the real estate market as well. So it's a short episode this time around. I hope you enjoy it. And if you're interested to know more about the stuff that we talk in this episode, leave us a comment. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe. If you're not watching this on YouTube, go to YouTube, hit subscribe. We'd love to see um, some more subscribers on that channel there. But that's enough from me. Let's get stuck right into it. And I'll see you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to Dash Dot Insider. Gabby and I are talking to you today, and we are talking about something that I'm actually really passionate about. A little bit controversial, maybe. Oh, but Gabby, yeah. first, how are you? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Been traveling Great. a lot lately. It's been good. Yes, yep. I've heard. Enjoying, <laughs> enjoying Bali. It's yeah. <laughs> You've been there. Anyway, we're not here to talk about our travel. We're not here to talk no. about coffee, which is often a topic oh. that we talk about as well. We're not here to talk about anything. What I want to talk about today, okay, well, you can drink some of your coffee. That's totally fine. What I want to talk about today is why, certainly why I don't care about the property market, maybe why we don't care about the property market, why, in fact, maybe it doesn't even matter at all. Well, look, (laughs) I know that you do not care about the property market, which, ironically, we've been talking about the property market for three, four years, and we work in the property market. So I think it is controversial. Let me clarify let me clarify my statement, right? So I obviously actually do care about real estate markets. What I don't care about is what people are saying about real estate markets in Australia. You know, there's this just over the last few years, one thing that has held to be completely true is that the media narrative is almost always incorrect. And the other layer to this, and the reason why I've stopped paying any attention to it, which might sound a little weird, you know, we're in the real estate space, surely it's important to keep your finger on the pulse and, you know, to be doing all this kind of stuff. But 99.999% of the stuff that you read on, on the internet, in the news, all of that kind of stuff is noise and it's backwards facing noise. And, you know, people say to me things like, oh my God, have you seen the latest such and such article that came out in the AFR about real estate? And I'm like, no. I've stopped even reading them. I, I literally don't care. And people are like, well, why don't you care? Like, why why do you not care? Does that mean that you're complacent? I'm like, no, it's actually the opposite. It's because we, I don't need to care. And the reason I don't need to care is because we've developed the technology that means that we've got a cheat code on the entire thing. And it just doesn't, like, it just doesn't matter. And for those of you who don't know what that is, the cheat code that we've built is... Um, a suburb selection algorithm that allows us to identify the right markets at the right time and a price and rent forecasting model, which allows us to see 15 months into the future in any real estate market in Australia. Now, if you could look at any market in Australia and with varying degrees of confidence, see what was going to happen next, would it matter what you read in the Australian, the Herald Sun, the AFR? No, it wouldn't. Like it would cease to, it would cease to matter. And the, the problem that we've got in the, you know, the common uh, vernacular or the common access to data and everything is it's all rear facing. You know, Core Logic will release monthly reports and they'll say, "Oh, look, this happened." It's like I don't care what happened. Like who cares what happened? What I care is what's about to happen. You know, you don't make money historically. If everyone could make money in the past, we'd all just go back and like, I don't know, we'd go back to, you know, April 2020 and all invest in the stock market or something like that, you know. Like, you, but That's you can't back to the future it. stuff. It is. Like like Biff going into <laughs> the, the future and getting the um, – <laughs> 
he get in the almanac. It's like, but we've actually got the almanac. We've kept, got a consistently dynamic almanac, which tells us what's happening 15 months into the future. So it's like, okay, well, why do I care? You know? And so it's, it's really fascinating to me because every, all of the stuff that people consume is so rear facing, so backwards facing, you know, you, you look at, uh, as I say, you know, core logic monthly reports or different indexes and they'll say, look what happened where we've been. And they say it in a way that makes you think that that is a reasonable piece of information to use to drive forward. It's like driving down the road, looking in the rear view mirror, hope, like hoping that the corner you see in the background as you turn into it is the corner that's in front of you. It's madness. It's complete madness. Like it doesn't even make any sense to, to be, it's like you, you don't have eyes in the back of your head for a reason. You have eyes in the front of your head. And so- not only is that the common way that people consume or, or distribute the information, but also you see people making investment decisions or investment recommendations mm. based on backwards-facing information. And I am con- continuously perplexed. You know, people who say things like, you should buy in this suburb because over the last 10 years, it grew by whatever, 10% a year. I say, like, if I see that, I'm like, run. Get out of there. Bad time. (laughs) That's that's not going to be good. Conversely, you know, like a sign to me that it could actually be something interesting is like it hasn't grown at all for the last 10 years. In fact, it might have gone down. I'm like, brilliant. Let's dig in a little bit deeper. Let's see what's going on there. Yeah, that's so funny because I'm actually remembering we had a conversation with a broker recently who was buying a property for himself Mm. and he had a conversation. I think it was with a buyer's agent who recommended, hey, buy in this location. It's grown Mm -hmm significantly the last 10 years and so I think he went and bought there and then it's done nothing since then and we're like that why are you looking backwards that does, <laughs> that doesn't make sense mm-hmm. yeah and this but this is the common this is the common thinking right and so mm-hmm. you know for those of you let me let me give a bit of background so um, for those of you who may not know uh, over the last three years something like that we've invested in developing really really sophisticated technology we've invested literally millions and millions of dollars in developing the capability to identify the right market at the right time and be able to look into the future now just to be super clear right when we are projecting into the future it's not 100 percent accurate but it does give you a pretty good idea maybe like a 70 percent um 70 percent um, understanding of where it's going, which is a pretty good, which is pretty good, right? If you if you had a seventy percent chance of winning the lottery, how many tickets would you buy, right? You know what I mean? It's like it's a pretty that's pretty bloody good, right? And so we can um, generally, with varying degrees of confidence, see where markets are going moving into the future, which is insanely powerful. Now, a lot of people think that you can't time markets, and I believe that if you think that you can't time markets, then you should just buy anything anywhere and hope for the best. You don't even need a real estate investing strategy. Just wing it because it's all guesswork. Fundamentally, that is incorrect. Timing the market is one of the most important things you can do. And I recently had uh, the opportunity to have a conversation with a billionaire last Saturday. In fact, we had a Zoom call. He's a billionaire in the US, lives in Puerto Rico, you know, super interesting. But his whole thesis is that timing is the most important thing. And he's one of the only people in the US that I've actually seen talking about this as well. And interestingly, he's built his own um, different types of models to be able to understand market timing type stuff as well. And he was talking to me and he was using the US market, so it's different to the Australian market. And he said, hey, we did a little thought exercise and he said, all right, if you invested $20,000 in real estate 37 years ago and you just stayed in the same market uh, for the whole 37 years, what would your inflation adjusted profit be after 37 years? And it was something like 30 grand, right? It was not much. Like I said, he said, what did you think? And I guessed it was, I guessed a high number because I was thinking compound over 37 years and it was really low. It was actually really low. I was like, okay, I look a little bit stupid. Fair enough. Uh, and then he said, okay, so what if, what if over the last 37 years, you could enter into the market at the bottom and you could exit at the top and you could do that in six different markets over 37 years. So enter in, exit, then move, move to another market, enter, exit. And he kind of like used examples to show how you would do that. Okay, you'd be in this market from this time to this time, take the money out. Six months later, you'd enter in this market, exit. So it was it was well thought out and he showed me the geography of it. And in the middle, he had a four month, he, he said, yeah, you could have a four month holiday, sit on a beach somewhere. He, he then modeled that out and he said, okay, how much money would you make by getting into the market at the right time and exiting at the right time? If you'd done that six times over 37 years, using the examples that he gave, how much money would you make? And I was thinking, okay, well, I stuffed up on the first one. It's obviously going to be more than 30 grand, but I didn't really want to guess. <laughs> the maths mapped out to be $166 million. 
$166 million, right? That is the difference. And that was adjusted for selling costs and all of that kind of stuff as well. And so, the, but what that does is, you know, you can expand your money and have, more, have a bigger pot each time. You're compounding your returns each time. You're diversifying, you buy more assets, all of that kind of stuff. And so, the idea of being able to understand when to get into a market, and, but also when to get out is so important, right? It's so important. Because a lot of people think you're making money, making money when you buy. And, you know, and I asked, we were talking about this the other day, Gabby, and, and I'm running off the gob here a little bit. You know that this is something I'm really passionate about. <laughs> but look, like, you know, if you ask someone, hey, is it more important to, what's, what would be more important, getting into the market at the right time or getting out of the market at the right time? And most people would probably say something like getting into the market at the right time, which is actually not true. It's actually not true. What's more important is actually knowing when to get out of the market. Because you could get into the market, let's say it's a five-year cycle. You could get into get into the market two two and a half years way through the growth cycle. But if you knew when to get out at the top, you would still have two and a half years of growth that you catalyze. But if you didn't know when to get out, you can end up losing money even if you bought it. You, you know what I mean? And so understanding those is is super important. So uh, for me, I just find this this whole like concept so fascinating. But but also more to the point that we built this cheat code, and it's quite funny talking to this billionaire as well. He actually said the same words. He said he said, you know what? Like the things that we've developed, it does make you feel like you're cheating. And I was like, well, that's literally how we feel every day. It's kind of like being able to print money for our clients. Anyway, I've waffled on a little bit there, Gabby. What did you want to get in? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about the the fact that timing is so important, and there is that common belief that it's not possible. And I think what yeah. we've been able to build over the last three, four years is really showing that it is possible. And so I think yeah. it's easy for common kind of narrative in the media and everything to say like mm. it's not possible because most people don't have access to this technology, right? Most people can't mm. predict the market. You can't know for certain when to enter, when to exit, those kind of things. Um, but on our yep. side, we can, which is pretty nuts. Yeah. And again, there's limitations to it, but having some optics is better than having no optics, right? And for the benefit of everyone listening as well, so around a few months ago, we actually carved out the technology side of Dashdot into a separate company called Global Prop Tech Solutions. So Global Prop Tech Solutions is the the engine behind all of this innovation that um that sits at the core of what Dashdot does as well. But that ability to to be able to see into the future fundamentally transforms, like you have to develop belief in it too, by the way, just to be clear. When we started developing algorithms that would identify the optimal time to get into the market, which was the first step, we first, the first step was we said, okay, well, how can we identify the right markets to get into? So that was the first step. So we developed algorithms to do that. Now, transparently, I didn't always believe the algorithms. What I can say, though, is that 99% of the time where I said, oh, look, the algorithm says yes, but you know what? I think I should say no. 99% of the time, I was proven to be incorrect and those markets ended up taking off. And it was only after enough times of that happening that I was like, you know what? I need to stop letting my personal ego get in the way and start Can believing in the system the that we created. Yeah. Trust the robots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so, you know, it can seem a little far-fetched, but I guess once you've done a few years of testing and like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, you know, assets purchased and well, thousands now actually, and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate purchased and seen this play out. And in fact, a lot of people think that, you know, a lot, I think we might have spoken about this a little bit before, but a lot of people think, oh yeah, if anyone could throw a dart at the dartboard over the last, you know, couple of years and make money, they're not saying that so much now in 2023 because a lot of people have seen markets go down, which again was something we were talking about a couple of years ago was, it was that was going to happen. But if we look at the outcome of what we did uh, between March 2020 and July 2022, during the boom, we'll call it, in every location that we purchased in, the locations outperformed the broader regional market in those areas by on an average by 50%. So that doesn't happen by accidentally throwing a dart at the dartboard and, and hoping for the best. And I think that where a lot of people go wrong, though, is that they do believe these kind of media narratives that are like, hey, you should go by here or hey, you should go by here. So, for example, like a lot of people are saying things like, go buy in the inner ring in Brisbane. And it's like, well, why would you do that? You know, like the I could share examples. I can actually share my screen and show what that looks like in terms of what the future looks like for those suburbs. And it's not great. You know, maybe if you're buying your home, if you're just buying, it's, I'm not, I don't mean it's going to crash, but it's like, ah, it doesn't look particularly good. Like, you know, yeah, on par, as a property investment, probably, there are probably better things you could do. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll call it mediocre. Long term, probably fine. 
And long term, kind of everything is going to be fine. And in fact, if you take a long enough time horizon, like you can have an almost 100% success rate in real estate as long as you have a long enough time horizon. But the idea with that for most people, that doesn't, that's not the way to do it. So yeah, I mean, you can, you can just basically pick anything and leave it for long enough and it'll all work out in the end. And that is also true. But if you could also pick something and go, I know what's going to happen with this asset over the next, over the next short term period and I can maximize return, that allows you to go much faster. And if you can go faster, you can compound your returns faster. And if you can compound your returns faster, you can achieve financial freedom faster. And at the end of the day, that is what we all want. There's no one who's investing in real estate that doesn't want to create a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. And so, you know, this idea of being able to do that is, is really, really important. And one thing, one big lesson um, that, that I've learned over the, last, over the last couple of years is the fact that you just can't reliably use rear-facing indicators. You know, even like, and use that to make an informed and intelligent property decision. Like it just doesn't work. What's an example of a rear-facing indicator? Oh, so like when CoreLogic uses, hey, this is what happened to prices in this suburb. It's like, well, that's what happened last month and the month before, but not necessarily where it's going. I mean, even if you look at most AVMs and what that is for the uninitiated is an automated valuation model, which is what companies like CoreLogic and Domain and Real Estate and like all this, when they use to provide valuations of properties, those automated valuations, even banks use them, they look backwards 90 days. And so even that, if the market is going up and it's looking backwards 90 days, it's going to undervalue an asset significantly. If the market is going down and it's looking back 90 days, it's going to overvalue an asset significantly. And so looking at rear-facing indicators never gives you an indication of what the current reality looks like. And so a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the way people make decisions is by looking backwards and then trying to use that to extrapolate forwards. Now, the predictive model that we built doesn't do that because I've seen people that have, in fact, you can get tools. You can literally just get like off the shelf tools where you can plug um, data sets into it and it'll say, well, based on everything that's happened before, here's the projection of what's going to happen in the future. Okay, which is pretty basic. Our model specifically uses um, 60 different indicators that we've, and 30, or is it 39 of them are completely proprietary to, that we've developed in house. And a lot of them aren't even like real estate market specific. And we fed it over 446 million data points and 460 different indicators. And, and it's, it's a very sophisticated model that actually allows us to extrapolate and see where demand is going, which is really, really unique. Because if you can see one of, I've said this before on the podcast, but the easiest way to make money is to work out where demand is going, stand in front of it and open your wallet. And if you can do that, like you're in the money. So to me, I think it, it's really interesting. And it's, it's something I've been pondering over the last, I don't know, I'll say a few months, probably since late last year, where I really started to switch off and tune out. You know, people mm. saying, oh, interest rates are rising or this property market's crashing or this area is doing this. And I was just like, yeah. whatever. Like when all of this stuff has been happening, 100% of our clients have made money. 100% of our clients have made money. Through this whole period where everyone's like, ah, property market's crashing. Ah, all of this kind of stuff's going on. I mean- is that even tr- is that even true? Because like, if we can have a hundred percent of our clients making gains during this period, like, how true is that narrative? And how can other people learn from this? And how can other people make better decisions? Is kind of my point. Yeah, I love like the the detox in the news. I mean, you and I are both partial to a information diet, so being able mm-hmm. to actually switch off, I would say that was probably a small part in deciding like, okay, we want to develop this technology and these algorithms to serve our clients, but then a piece of it is also like all of this noise is just confusing and inaccurate Mm. and people are making terrible decisions. Why don't we create a tool and methodologies that actually means we don't have to pay attention to that. And so I love that we've gotten to that point, even with our team as well. It's like occasionally someone will send like a news article um, in, in the, in the team channels referencing like a location that we called like a year ago or something, and then they'll say, "Oh, this mm. this is a new hotspot," you know. So mm. I love I love that that even the team is starting to be like, "Okay, we're kind of using external sources just as like validation, like a year or so down the mm. line that we're kind of it's it's correlated." Yeah, it's so interesting because like media artifacts become observationally interesting, but not behaviorally impacting or behaviorally influencing. And so, you know, when you see, you know, because people share articles and it's like, oh, hey, look, such and such, this real estate market is booming or this market, real estate market is crashing or whatever the current current thing is in the media. It's like, 
that's interesting to watch someone doing that. And I don't want to get all like, I don't want this to come across in the wrong way. I hate using these words, but you know, you hear people talk about like things like exiting the matrix, right? Where they start to then (laughs) disconnect or, or like start to actually operate outside the norm. Looking at that kind of stuff is like looking through a looking glass and going, huh, isn't that really interesting and curious? Look at that thing that's going on there. And then we're operating in a way that is completely detached from it because it's like, well, that's, that's kind of really curious. The thing that I'm most interested in is the fact that most people pay attention to it. And so what mm-hmm. I find most interesting about media articles is that it helps you to understand where sentiment is going. And I've spoken about this before that, you know, psychographics do drive markets more than demographics, et cetera. And so understanding the consumer sentiment is really interesting because the headlines will reflect the sentiment and then also impact the sentiment. So it's kind of like a, a feedback loop that plays into itself. So you get, kind of get to get a sense of that, but it's so interesting when you're sort of like, ah, oh, this, this information is, or this article is not information. It's just, it's like a curiosity artifact. It's, it becomes really interesting to think about the market like that. And then you just go, okay, well, I don't really care about that because none of it's true anyway. We've got this other set of set of information here, which is proving to be consistently true time and time again. What I love most about it too is the benefit and impact that it can bring to clients because what I'm noticing systematically is in real estate investing, 99% of property investors never get to five properties, 90% get stuck at two properties, et cetera. Most of our clients end up buying two, three, four, et cetera. But that happens over a couple of years period, which is still very, very, very fast. And what I find increasingly interesting is that even the clients who start working with us who are quite conservative at the start and like, which is totally cool, right? But they're quite conservative and, you know, in their thinking and everything like that, get to a point where they're just like, I literally don't even care what's happening in the media. I I can buy again now. Let's go again (laughs) now. And they start they start to then live that out. And they're the ones that are buying, you know, one of our clients, actually one of our clients last week was buying property number four, quite conservative, worked at a bank, all of that kind of stuff. It's like buying property number four, started their family, another one's buying. And it's like, and that's in 18 months. And it's really interesting to see these individuals now starting to operate outside of the typical cycle of consumer sentiment as well. I t- I, and I really feel that is such an impactful way to kind of, or an impactful gift to give people. What do you think? Yeah, that's interesting because I think coming back to the narrative of the the podcast, how we've how we've kind of changed it to Dash Dot Insider, it's like a lot of this is these are the beliefs that we hold inside Dash Dot, and it's like mm. if more people could see what we can see and have faith in the data and the science and the technology, and kind of not purely base your investment decisions on outsider perspectives, like that's. Yeah. That's how we can impact people. So I'm thinking through like being able to share more of this in the podcast is really exciting. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. And if you're listening to this and you do want want to hear more of this or you do want to go deeper on it, you can uh, let, let us know. If you're on YouTube, just leave us a comment on this video and tell us you want to, you want to hear more of this kind of stuff and we can go into it because we can start showing stuff as well, which would be pretty fun and pretty interesting, uh, which I would also like to do. Gabby, I know that we've kind of waffled on and talked about how cool it is that we've got all this stuff that we can predict the market. Is there anything else we need to kind of dig into here that is going to make this more impactful to people? How do you want to think about that? I think I was just, yeah, I was just thinking about uh, like locations versus properties. So it's all well and good Mm. to identify the right locations, right? But surely that's not enough. Like I'd imagine, I know Mm. that people... Some people will go out and hear, you know, this is the next hotspot and then I'll just buy any asset in that location. How much does yep. asset come into play if you've got the right location? That is such a great question and I'm going to answer that in a couple of parts because I think it's going to be really meaningful. So you can buy a really great property and when I talk about a great property, it might be like, fairly new, doesn't need any maintenance. It's like nice. It's it, Let's go to the extreme. It's brand new. It's perfect. It's just been built. doesn't need any maintenance. Everything's exactly right. And you could buy that in the wrong part of a suburb that is like, so at suburb level, we could see that it's going to grow, but you could buy an absolutely perfect asset in the wrong part of that suburb and get no growth. Or in fact, you might even get negative growth. Inversely, you could also buy an asset which 
potentially is, and I'll, I'll use an example here. And I don't know if I've used this example in a podcast before, but one of our clients, Jay, he was uh, working with us right at the start of, right when COVID was starting, he was buying his very first property. COVID hit, the whole kind of world went into turmoil, but he still went through with buying a property and hats off to him. The asset we bought at that time had problems. This was his first property. This was his first property that he was ever buying, but it needed like half of its stumps replaced. It was not particularly beautiful. It was kind of like could probably do with a renovation. Not that it, aside from the stumps, structurally it was all good, but like the decor was like, you know, it was like it was an old person's home and it had old person's decor from like the 70s or something like that. It was pretty dated. If you looked at it, you'd be like, oh, geez, I don't know about this property. Like, what is this going to do? Now, we had the conviction because we know what we know. We had the conviction to say, no, this is going to be a great asset. And so we helped him through that. Uh, the stumps didn't need to be replaced for like 12 months. Yeah, had the time to be able to pull some equity out of it, all of that kind of stuff. Now, that asset, which you know a lot of people would probably say is subpar and actually might not buy, grew some, by something like, and don't quote me on this, but something like 47% in you know a fairly short, short period of time. So Jay did fantastically well out of that asset. Now, I know other people who have bought great properties that have done nothing. They've bought beautiful properties and they're going, it's new and I don't need any work, but they've bought when the market is declining or they've bought in the wrong part of the suburb. Now, the wrong part of the suburb can be defined by in many, many different ways. Sometimes there's geographical issues or geographical or topographical issues. For example, in this particular suburb that we bought, they have an issue with, I think it's called like black soil or black, anyway, they've got an issue with like certain parts of the suburb have soil types which are tremendously problematic and so you could buy an asset which is which is no good or it's on top of like a you know and so you can do all this kind of stuff and then there's also public housing issues or flood issues and you know the difference between buying the right asset and the wrong asset in the right suburb can be some difference of a distance of like 50 meters to 100 meters you could buy the right thing or the wrong thing and so getting that right and understanding what to look for is massive now i will say though that location selection is 80% of the work, right? So if you can get the right location, location getting down to that granularity, right? Getting down to that granularity of like right street in the right suburb, not just the right suburb. The the right location will do 80% or maybe even more than 80% of the lifting. So to the degree that you can buy an asset, and in fact, we've we've done this before. We bought an asset, which was a dump, basically a fixer-upper. The plan was to fixer-upper it, but we never did. (laughs) Guess what? That property's doubled in value. It's like, okay, so objectively speaking, it is subpar. (laughs) It's not great, right? (laughs) Um, And we just haven't gotten around to fixing it. And look, the rents are set accordingly and our tenants are happy. And hey, no problem. We fix things when they break. All good. But, you know, the paint's buggered and it's sloping a little bit. And, you know, there's some stuff going on with it. But the, the asset value has doubled. Okay, and we haven't done anything to it. So if you can get the right property in the right location, that's actually going to be probably more like 95% of the returns you're going to get. And then there's going to be a little sliver, which is based on the quality or you know the, the adjusted returns after you put money into it, if you have to do any repairs and all of that kind of stuff. And so where I think a lot of people... So let me just kind of crystallize this in a couple of ways. I think people make mistakes in a couple of major areas. Number one, they face... They look backwards when they should be looking forward. So they'll be like... Oh my God, Coogee has grown by 10% a year for the last 10 years. That means it's going to grow by 10% a year for the next 10 years. Probably cliff notes, cheat cheat notes uh, here, or spoiler alert, it's probably not going to, right? So get over it and look somewhere else. Second thing is that people worry too, people worry too much about what the quality of the asset is like and they in two ways. Number one, they're prizing that over whether or not is it the right property in the right place. And they also superimpose their own personal opinions on the quality of that asset. Like, would I like it? I think Sean and I talked about this uh, in a recent episode, but we had a client who was like a a luxury home builder, you know, high-end finishes and stuff like that, bought a property in a regional Queensland market. The, The asset was totally suitable for the market. They actually flew up there to check it out, but they're so used to luxury finishings and doing all this kind of stuff. They were freaking out that they bought a dump and then they did nothing basically and it got a tremendous amount of growth. They made $50,000 in like two months off a relatively low cost asset. And so getting these kind of pieces right and detaching from the detaching from your own emotions and detaching from the emotions of the society around you is critical to making better investment decisions. If you make data-driven decisions, you're going to be right 99.9% of the time. 
that is what I have seen over the last four years, you know, and literally hundreds of millions of dollars of assets and well over a thousand properties purchased. It's it that's that's where the difference is. Awesome. Sweet. Cool. Gabby, do you think this has been a good episode? What do you reckon? I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so time. too. I hope so I too. Hope so. I hope so. <laughs> I was actually going to show some examples of the predictive models, but we didn't quite get to we didn't quite get to a place mm. where that made sense. So, ooh, maybe we'll tease that for another episode. If you would like to see, drop a comment, send an email, let us know. Indeed, and wherever you are, make sure you make sure you're subscribing and make sure you're sharing this with somebody else, um, because I do think there are a lot of lessons in here about how you need to think a little bit differently and what you're seeing, even from reputable sources. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that the companies that are reporting data are unreputable. They're great. It's just they face backwards. Everyone from SQM to CoreLogic to all that kind of stuff. So just think when you're reading your next media article that says, hey, this is what's going to happen and they reference historical data, that's a really good check mark for you to say, well, is that even true and how could I know that to be true? And then maybe start to seek out some alternative perspectives on what that might look like and start to think, well, what's going to drive where it's going? And put your eyes forward on the road, not backwards. That would be my that would be my piece of advice. I just a little kind of little segue. In 2023, that is going to be the difference between the people who make a tremendous amount of success and those who do nothing or have a tremendous amount of failure. I am watching people in this space giving advice to go and buy in locations which fundamentally are at the top of their cycle. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to crash. It doesn't mean they're going to crash. That's not what I'm saying. But they are going to have be suboptimally performing moving forward. And so my advice is to think deeply about where the market is going and you can do that by looking backwards, but it's almost always inverse. You know, if it has done nothing for 10 years, it's, it's more likely that it's going to grow. If it's done heaps for 10 years, more likely that it's not going to grow. So have a little think about that when you're making investment decisions. And of course, make sure you're getting rock solid advice along the way. Gabby, I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Thanks, Gabby. Appreciate it. If you like this episode, make sure you share it and leave us a comment and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.